if you would open your Bibles, uh, please, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And we're going to actually read uh, the whole text. I was going to just read verses 23 to 34, but uh, I'm going to incorporate uh, verses 17 to 22 in it as well. So it'll be a little bit of reading here. Um, so let's read verses 17 through 34, please. I think it's needful to have a clear teaching of the Word of God uh, on all subjects and all topics, uh, obviously including the Lord's Supper, especially in this day and age where there's just mass confusion about just about everything and um, contradictions uh, abound everywhere. And I think it's just important to have clear biblical teaching that comes from Scripture that you can point to chapter and verse and uh, cite it and see it clearly for yourselves. So hopefully that's uh, what you'll find uh, today as we go through this passage. I'm going to begin reading now, again, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm beginning in verse 17, reading to the end of the chapter. It reads, Now in giving these instructions, I do not praise you, since you come together not for the better but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part I believe it. For there must, be, there must also be factions among you, that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others, and one is hungry and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in, or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. For I receive from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason... Many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. But if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, lest you come together for judgment. And the rest I will set in order uh, when I come. We're going to break down this uh, passage into three parts. Uh, verses 17 to 22 is Paul's correction of what was transpiring in the church of Corinth. Then in verses 23 to 26, we have the, um, the institution of the Lord's Supper by Christ himself and in in reminding him, us of how he instituted the Lord's Supper, what he said. And then verses 27 to 34 is how we are to examine ourselves or how we are to approach the Lord's table. I think it's interesting in uh, verse 17 to begin with that uh, Paul says that in this matter that he's addressing, which is how they're partaking of the Lord's table uh, in their church, is that he has no praise for them. In fact, when they come together, it's not for the better, it's for the worse. Can you imagine the Lord saying about uh, our church that, you know, it'd be better off if y'all didn't come together because when you come together, it's not for the better, it's for the worse. 
And he tells us in the very next verse why it is that it's worse when they come together. He says, for first of all, the word first, protos, meaning chief, or in other words, this is Paul's main concern. This is his biggest concern with their church and how they're partaking of the Lord's Supper. He says, my biggest concern is that when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part, I believe it. So he's recognizing that there's divisions, and this word divisions means, means tears, schisms. People are separated into groups uh, based on what they believe or what they think about any given topic. And uh, there's division here. And he says that's why when you come together, things are not better, they're worse. Uh, in other words, if you were to ask the question, how bad is division? Division is so bad that when you come together, it's worse. <laughs> it makes the fellowship worse. It doesn't make the fellowship better. To make the fellowship better would be to come together in unity. And the reason that's important is because that is the first point that we're going to make. There's six points we plan to make. The first point is this, is that the Lord's Supper is intended to be a point of unity. A point of unity. In fact, in the previous chapter, in verse 17, in, in talking a little bit about the supper, he says, for, for we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. So when they would partake of communion, they would uh, partake of one loaf of bread. It's one loaf of bread because we're partaking of one Christ. And in partaking of one loaf of bread, it's symbolic of the union that we have in Christ that we're partaking of one loaf, one Christ, which represents the one Christ, the one body of Christ, and we ourselves are one bread. We're one body, we're one loaf, we're one body of Christ. It's not the bodies of Christ, plural, it's the body of Christ, singular. It's one loaf, one bread. And so when we're coming together, there's to be in the Lord's Supper this sense of unity or oneness because the Lord has made us one in Christ. He goes on to say, for there must also be factions. Uh, factions here is where we get the word heresies. And Paul sees uh, these divisions, these factions, um, as necessary. They, they must happen. They're, they're inevitable. Now, why, why would he say something so bold as that, for there must also be factions among you. Uh, there, there must be. There, it's inevitable for these things to happen. Well, first of all, let me say this. I hope you realize that when you study the epistles, the letters to the church uh, in the New Testament, what you find is that every single church, there is a correction that takes place. There is no such thing as a perfect church. And the reason why you don't have a perfect church is because you have imperfect people who are still in the process of sanctification. It is an unglorified church. And as an unglorified church, every church has issues, every one of them. If you're, if you, if you're looking for a perfect church, this certainly is not it. If you leave here to look for a perfect church, I assure you that will not be it. There is not a perfect church. And Paul seems to be of the impression that divisions can be corrected through the teaching of the Word. That through the teaching of the Word, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction and, right for correction and for instruction in righteousness. So the Word of God is profitable to correct the errors in the church. And Paul seems to be of the impression that if he can teach the Word of God and these people will listen to him and become doers of the Word and not hearers only, that these divisions, these schisms can be overcome. That he doesn't see uh, these divisions, and there's a lot of them in Corinth. You remember 1 Corinthians 1? 
They're saying, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas. They're divided by their favorite teachers. They're divided over civil issues. They have brothers suing brother in 1 Corinthians 6. They're divided over marriage issues in 1 Corinthians 7. What if my spouse isn't a believer? Should I divorce him or her? Should I, should I be celibate in the marriage? I mean, there's all these divisions going on. 1 Corinthians 8, uh, they're divided over uh, doubtful things. 1 Corinthians 14, they're divided over spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians 11, they're divided over class, the rich and the poor. There's a lot of division, but Paul's of the impression that these things can be overcome. If agreement on every issue was our measure for fellowship, we would never fellowship with anybody. <laughs> would you say amen to that? Right? You, you wouldn't fellowship with your wife or your husband because you don't agree with them all the time. You wouldn't fellowship with your kids because you don't agree with them all the time. They wouldn't fellowship with you because they don't agree with you all the time. And on and on and on. You know, friends at work, your co-workers, your boss, there's times you don't agree. And, and, and if you base your fellowship only on full agreement on all things, you would never fellowship. So he believes these can be overcome. And now this is interesting. He says, for there must also be factions among you. It's inevitable. You're in a, fallen, in a fall, fallen world with fallen people. And even in the body of Christ, we're still in this path of sanctification. He says that. In other words, so that. This is the reason. That those who are approved may be recognized among you. So if you're going to be approved, that means there has to be something proving you. There has to be something testing you. There has to be something trying you if you're going to stand approved. And in context, the obvious thing that is testing them, that's proving them, are these divisions, these schisms, these tears in the fellowship. It's these heresies, these other teachings that have entered the fellowship. And that's what's tearing, that's what's proving, that's what's testing them. Now, scripture that I thought of uh, in relation to this is you realize this, that we as believers, listen to me, we are, character is forged by means of pressure, by difficulties, by disagreements, by challenges that arise. That is where character is developed. And I'm going to give you a scripture here quickly. Romans 5, verse 3 and 4. You don't have to turn there. I'm going to be right back in 1 Corinthians 11. He says, and not only that, but we also glory in tribulations. <laughs> what are you, crazy? How are we going to glory in tribulations? He says this, knowing, what do we know? That tribulation produces perseverance or endurance. And perseverance, character, and character, hope. So notice how he says character comes about. Character comes about because you learn to persevere in the midst of tribulation. That when tests come, you don't give up. You persevere, you endure, you go through it. And then as that character is developed by persevering in the tribulation, hope is the result. Now what does that mean? It means this. It means that the Lord has come through for me the last 150 times. <laughs> Right, I've persevered through all of these trials and tests over life. And every single time the Lord comes through. Every single time the Lord doesn't fail me. And so it creates this hope, this confident expectation that no matter what happens, no matter what happens in church, and what happens at home, no matter what surgery you go through, no matter what disease comes to you, no matter what challenge arises in your life, you're going to persevere through it. That perseverance is going to give you character and your character is going to cause you to have hope because you're going to say the Lord does not fail. Amen. So they're being proved. They're being tested. And, and in this, this, this testing of division and schisms and factions in the church, uh, the approved are then recognized. So we have to ask ourselves this question, what does it mean to be approved? How, how do you and I stand approved in the fellowship to be recognized? In other words, to step to the forefront, to, to rise to the surface, to, to rise to the top. 
And the answer is this. When divisions arise, when schisms arise, when heresies come in, the question is this, and it's always this. There's only one of two ways to respond to that. You are either going to respond biblically, or you are going to respond unbiblically. You're either going to respond spiritually, or you're going to respond in the flesh. You're either going to respond according to scriptures and what is clearly stated in the Word of God, and you're going to submit yourself to that, and by that you're going to be approved. Or you're going to resist it, you're going to reason it out, and you're going to follow the dictates of your own heart and your own understanding, and you're going to resist it, and you're going to stand disapproved. And the approved, Paul says, are going to emerge in the midst of this division. The approved are going to emerge as those who followed the scriptures, as those who followed Christ, as those who followed the word of God. And they're going to step to the forefront. They're going to ascend to the top. They're going to be recognized and the disapproved are not. He then goes on in verse 20. And he's bringing this now, what is going on, this division, this schism, your gathering is for the worse, not for the better. Um, there's a testing going on, a proving going on, and the proved are going to be recognized as those who obeyed the Bible, those who obeyed the Lord, those who obeyed the Word of God. And the disapproved will be shown that they are not. I, I could get into a couple of things uh, about... The approved and disapproved. I, I, I think the approved, like I know the ESV and I think some others, they, they use the word uh, genuine. Right? These divisions, they divide the genuine from the ingenuine. The sincere from the insincere. And I will say this about genuine believers. Is that genuine believers, thinking that right now of the parable of the sower, one thing that can be said about them is they have good ground. They've got good soil. Meaning that they may not get it right away. It may sh right over their head. But they're going to stick with it because they're good ground. They're good soil. And, and one day that seed of God's Word is going to penetrate the heart and it's going to bear fruit 30, 60, and 100 fold. Because that's what believers do. Believers eventually get it. They eventually follow the scripture, even if they fight with it, wrestle with it at first, eventually they submit. Unbelievers don't. They resist all the way to the end. But a believer will get it so that they're genuine, they're sincere, and they're approved, and therefore recognized. Moving on now to verse 20 and 22, uh, 22, 22. Now he's taking this, so you understand what he's talking about. Now, now he's going to the Lord's table now and what's taking place. Um, notice it says, therefore, when you come together in one place, it's not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others, and one is hungry and another is drunk. What, do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. So, so follow me now. This is, this is uh, well, we don't know every detail. This is a general idea of how they would have received the Lord's Supper. Now remember, worship was on the Lord's Day, which was the first day of the week. The first day of the week was a work day. So this kind of does away with the whole idea that the first century t church had some sort of a Sabbath keeping that they did on the Lord's Day because the Lord's Day was the first day of the week in their culture and they were back at work already. So their meetings, their Christian meetings, were either very early in the morning or late in the evening after they finished work. So let's just assume for a moment that their meetings were in the evening. It would make more sense based on how this is, this is structured. So what would happen is the rich... 
They probably owned their own businesses. They had a little bit more flexibility of time management because they're the boss. So they leave work early. They, they bring in the best food and the best drink because they're wealthy. They get there first, they eat, they drink, they don't wait for anybody, they're full, they're drunk. And then a little later, your tradesmen and your craftsmen come. They got a bag of lunch, you know, they got a you know, peanut butter sandwich and, uh, and uh, you know, an apple or something. And then, and then after that, your slaves start coming because they have to work for their masters and they can't leave till their masters say they can leave. So here comes the slaves, and we know in the Roman Empire about 20% of the Roman Empire was made up of slaves. So there was a lot of slaves in the church. And so the slaves would get there. And slaves didn't have anything to eat, and they would get there, and all the food would be gone, and the, the rich would be drunk and full, and then the rest, they don't have anything to eat and partake of because what they would do is they would have a fellowship meal or a love feast, as it's often called in Scripture. They'd have this love feast before they'd have the Lord's Supper. So imagine you're the rich. You get there, you eat, you're, you're full, you're drunk. And now, finally, the, uh, the poor get there, the slaves get there, and you say, all right, let's have the Lord's Supper. <laughs> What does that say about Christian unity? Right, that, that they're taking uh, the Lord's Supper, which represents to us the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, and here these people, instead of being sacrificial, are being selfish. And they're, they're partaking of the, this, this feast before anybody would get there. And then when they get there, it's time to have the, the Lord's Supper. And Paul rebukes me, says, it's not even the Lord's Supper anymore. What you're doing is not the Lord's Supper. So I want you to picture this because this is important in what he's going to say in just a moment as we get into verse 27 in just a moment. This is important. Understand, they're coming together for the worse, not for the better. There's divisions. There's factions. They're separating into groups. They're, uh, they're alienating people, isolating people from the fellowship based on class, based on rich and poor. That's what's going on, okay? Now, what does Paul do? In verse 23, he reminds them of the institution of the Lord's Supper and, and by using the words of Jesus and, and a little bit of commentary, he reminds them of the purpose of the Lord's Supper, of what is actually taking place, because they've turned it into something that is not the Lord's Supper. So he's going to remind them of the, the words of Christ. So in verse 23, For I received from the Lord. Now I like this because, ask yourself this question, who is the one that instituted the Lord's Supper? Jesus, right? So whatever we believe about the Lord's Supper, it should come directly from the words of Jesus. And, and listen to me. There's not a whole lot of data in the Bible about this. There's, there's Matthew 26, there's Mark 14, and there's Luke 22. The Synoptic Gospels all showing when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper at that final Passover meal the night that he was betrayed. And then here in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. That's it. And it's all talking about the same event. And so you would think that for the church, it would be easy to get this, understand this, and practice it rightly and have the right meaning of the Lord's Supper. But leave it to theologians to mess it all up and make it complicated and difficult so that the church is divided basically four different ways on this topic. <laughs> but what we're going to do, and what I, I always challenge you to do this, is to, what does the Bible clearly state? Not what did somebody bring to the text, but what does the Bible clearly state? What does it clearly articulate? And just follow that. So he's going he's to recite what the Lord said. And I, I find it interesting. He says that, that which I also delivered to you, that, which, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. Now, I think it's interesting that he brings this out. And I think it's interesting for two reasons. But one of the reasons it's interesting is this. Remember what he's talked about. The church is divided. There's schisms. There's factions. They're alienating people from the fellowship. And all these things are going on. 
Did you realize that the Lord's Supper was instituted in the midst of the greatest division that ever happened on the planet? The greatest traitor, the Judas kiss was going to happen that same night. He was going to get up from the table, Judas, leave that table and go betray him. And later that night, come back and give him the Judas kiss and betray the master. And in the midst of the greatest division was this institution of the Lord's Supper that would carry on all the way until the second coming of Christ. Isn't that beautiful? That, that in the midst of division comes this, this beautiful memorial meal that would be a practice. The, the second reason it's important is because it gives us context as to when the Lord instituted the Lord's Supper and the when is at the final Passover meal. So the last Passover becomes the first Lord's Supper. And we're not going to expound on that at all because we've done that in previous times. In fact, the last time we, we talked about this, that's what we talked about. We're not going to touch that at all. We're just going to leave it there. He goes on, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take ye, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So number one, the Lord's Supper is to be a point of unity for the body of Christ. It should be something that we are in unity about completely. Secondly, it's a time of remembrance. It's a time of remembrance. I want you to hear this. When Jesus mentions the bread and the cup... The only command attached to the bread and the cup is the command to do this in remembrance of me. What happens is people with, with so many different views that are out there, they get caught up on what's going on with the bread and the cup and they forget about what the bread and the cup represent, which is what Jesus is pointing to. That the bread and the cup represent his body and his blood. The body that bore our sin on the tree and the blood that was shed for our justification. And what people do is they get so enamored by the elements and what's going on with the elements. Is this really the body and blood of Jesus? Is the body and blood of Jesus around, under, and with it? Is the spiritual presence of Christ inside of the loaf and inside of the wine? Or, or is it just like Jesus said? <laughs> yeah. Imagine that. Could it be just what Jesus says it is, that it's to be done in remembrance of me? Not looking to the elements themselves, but looking to Christ whom the elements represent. The elements don't do what the body and the blood of Christ do. Just as the water and baptism does not do what the blood of Christ does, right? The symbols don't do anything. It's the body and blood of Christ that does something or did something. Amen? So whatever we want to say about the Lord's Supper, we know this much. It is a time of remembrance of Christ, of His body that was broken for us and His blood that was shed for us. That much we can be certain of and we can be bold in stating that. Now why is that important? Because a lot of people, they'll poke fun at that. We'll say, well, that, that's a minimalist view. It's a minimalist view. Well, I ask you this. We as Christians... Let, let me pause back up just a minute. Do you realize that Jesus institutes for us a constant reminder to remember? constant reminder to remember, which indicates to me that we as Christians, we forget. How many times do Christians fall back into guilt and condemnation over their past sins or their past life, forgetting that they've been washed in the blood, that they've been purified by the Lamb, that they've been sanctified by faith in Him? How many times do Christians live under this constant sense of condemnation rather than the glorious liberty of the children of God? Or, also within the church, what happens very often among us is this. 
is we as Christians, we get caught up in the busyness of the church, the activities of the church, what's going on in the church. You know, you know, Sister Susie is sick, and I wonder what happened in the council meeting, and I wonder if Pastor Sermon's going to be shorter this week than last week, and, I, I, you know, what, what, who's going to lead the praise and worship this week, and what are the songs going to be, and are they going to start a youth group, and what are they doing with that, and, you know, when are the windows going to be done, and, and, and what are we going to do about this, and what are we going to do about that, and, you know, if we start something new or people going to come to it and when was the last men's fellowship meeting and and you start to get into all these things you know how's the budget doing is there enough money to do all these things and you know what missionaries are we going to support and why are we supporting them and you you get caught up in all the busyness and all the activities and all the things going on or what happens I see this all the time and, and I'm not saying it's entirely bad but we all get caught up in you know what's our favorite teaching So you go to some churches, it's all about, you know, spiritual warfare. And the other churches, it's all about the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. And another church, it's all about the five points of Calvinism. And other churches, it's all about, you know, uh, male and female roles and all of these different things. Not that any of those things are wrong. Um, You know, as long as something is in the Scripture, we can teach it. Uh, We do that here, right? But you can get so caught up on all of those things that pretty soon, if you'd be honest, you forget about Christ, the central figure of Christianity. You forget about the simplicity of our faith and the simplicity of Christ and, and what it means to be a Christian. And pretty soon the gospel is on the back burner and we're talking about all these other things and we never talk about Jesus anymore. And so we have this this institution of the Lord's Supper that's forcing us to remember every single time that we partake so that we don't lose our foundation, that we don't lose our grounding, that we always come back to the basics of the Christian faith and what it means to be a believer in Christ. Because what separates us from every religion on this planet is what we believe about Christ in His person and in His work. That's the dividing line. So, it is not only a time of remembrance. He says that we're also proclaiming uh, the Lord's death till he comes, verse 26. And so now he brings out that it's proclamation. We're proclaiming something. We're preaching. By means of the Lord's Supper, we are preaching the Lord's death till He comes. That's what we're looking at. That's what we're proclaiming. It's a, it's a visible sermon of the Lord's death. I always like for you to think of it this way and, and take these words to heart. That, that when we administer the bread in just a moment and we administer the cup in just a moment, that just as real as you hold that bread in your hand... Just as real as you hold that cup in your hand. Just as real as you eat that bread and you taste that bread and that bread goes down uh, your throat. And you do the same with the cup. The just as real as that is, is, is how real what Christ did on the cross is. Right? These are elements pointing to Christ. These are symbols pointing to Christ. That just as real as that is, what Jesus did is real. It actually happened. So we're proclaiming the Lord's death and we're doing it until he comes, meaning, and meaning we're not going to be taking communion, the Lord's table, throughout all of eternity. We're, we're going to, when the Lord returns, we will enjoy uh, with him the messianic banquet. Uh, even Jesus himself said uh, that I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. That's Luke chapter 22, verse 18. I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. That's in, uh, in conjunction with him instituting the Lord's Supper. Now, that's interesting, right? Because he sees a future kingdom to come. And we know that he is the one who brings that future kingdom. That when he comes, he brings his kingdom with him. In that kingdom, we will eat with him. And we will celebrate face to face and no longer just by faith, but we'll do it by sight. So we're doing this, that's number three, we're proclaiming the Lord's death. Number four, there's this eschatological hope. We're looking forward to the coming of the Lord. That we recognize that we're between these two comings of Christ. And at, and at the Lord's Supper, what we're doing today is we're looking back to the cross and we're looking forward to his second coming. 
and we're right here in the middle, and we're looking, we're looking, you know, I shouldn't say the middle, we're somewhere closer to the second coming than we were the first, right? But we're celebrating, looking back, remembering his death, and we're looking forward to his soon return. And that's what we're doing here today. In closing, verse 27. I'm not going to be able to do a very good job with this, so I'm just going to try to bring out uh, the main point and close uh, for sake of time so we can enjoy the, the, the table together. Now he's going to get into another point, and that is the need for self-examination. And the last point is the possibility of danger. The possibility of danger. So notice in verse 27, he says these words, Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. Now follow me. You'll notice that from verses 23 through 26, and now verses 27 to 32, is this. He changes his focus from the, the vertical to the horizontal. He goes from, do this in remembrance of me, uh, looking past the bread and the cup to what they represent, which is the body and blood of Christ, the once and for all sacrifice of Christ that saved me from my sins. But now he's talking about horizontal. Let a man examine himself. So he goes from vertical, now he's horizontal. This is what I want to bring out to you, and, and, and it just clicked for me this way, um, I don't know, somewhere between last night and this morning. Um, a, a specific way of addressing this, uh, and I think it'll help time-wise as well. But, but notice this, um, in verse 27, Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks the cup, this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Well, that's scary. I mean, guilty of the body and blood of the Lord? You mean that I go from the position of the redeemed to the position of those who crucified our Lord, who murdered our Savior, if I partake in an unworthy manner. So whatever an unworthy manner is, I don't want that. Because I don't want to be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. I want to be on the side of the redeemed who, uh, who are not guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. I, I, the, he goes on though, and he, he brings out, but let a man examine himself so... To, to make sure we don't partake in an unworthy manner, but in a worthy manner, he says to examine yourself. And so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. In other words, we examine ourselves not to exclude you from the supper. We self-examine so we can be included in the supper. Let a man examine himself and so let him eat. Right? Very often what you hear is, well, you better examine yourself and you're not fit, then you can't eat. No, he's saying examine yourself so you can eat. Examine yourself so you can repent and eat. So it's not for the exclusion of you, but for the inclusion of you. But you have to do the examination precedes the partaking. Again, the examination precedes the partaking. And then he goes on, for he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, so there's that words again, unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, what reason? Not discerning the Lord's body. Many are weak, sick, and they're dying. Well, that sounds serious. Weak, sick, dying. Because they're not discerning the Lord's body. So this is what I saw. Are you ready? The self-examination... And the unworthy manner go together. Right? When you find out what you're examining, then you know how to partake in a worthy manner. The, those two things are interconnected, right? Because if you're an unworthy manner, you examine yourself and then you can eat and drink. So those two things go together. What else goes together, and I think this is the point, this is what you have to address first, and then we'll come back to examining ourselves and then we'll close, is this. 
He says, for this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. What reason again? Not discerning the Lord's body. In other words, the judgment of the Lord has come upon this congregation because they're not discerning the Lord's body. So we have to define that. And once you define what he means by not discerning the Lord's body, you can then define what it means to self-examine and then what it means to partake of in a worthy manner so that we can all partake this day with a clear conscience. So what does he mean by that? Not discerning the Lord's body. And then we'll, 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 cl we'll close with these points. What he means is twofold. Because, because, because uh, his body is spoken of two different ways in this text. Uh, number one, he's referring to the actual physical body of Christ. Discerning the Lord's body, right? It's not, the, it's not the bread. It's remembering Jesus whom the bread represents. You're, you're remembering Jesus today. You're not remembering yourself. You're remembering Christ today. So discern the Lord's body. Discern the fact that Jesus' body was the sin-bearing instrument that took your sins. That it was in his body that he bore the punishment for our sins. Discern that, see that, know that, believe that. Secondly, it can refer to the spiritual body, which is the body of Christ, the church. Um, what did he talk about in verses 17 to 22? Divisions, schisms, factions, uh, alienating people from the fellowship. You know that it's still in Paul's mind because if you were to read verses 33 and 34, he goes right back to verses 17 to 22 and he's talking about how they're treating one another in the fellowship. So what he is saying is this, is not discerning the Lord's body. Many are weak, sick, and dying prematurely. Is this discern the physical body of Christ that was the sin-bearing instrument and discern the body of Christ, the church? In other words, this is what you're self-examining. Self-examination is not self-righteousness. It's not self-worthiness. It's not, I assess myself and I dotted my T's and crossed my I's, or, or dotted my I's and crossed my T's. It's not, it's not I, I did more, my list of good this week is longer than my list of bad this week. It's not self-righteousness. You're not the focus of the supper. The focus of the supper is on remembering Him. What did Christ do for you? Not what did you do for Christ, but what did Christ do for you? So you're examining yourself. What am I examining? Am I trusting in Christ? Am I trusting in his body that was broken for me? Am I trusting in his blood that was shed for me? Or am I trusting in my own self-righteousness that I'm somehow meriting salvation? Or am I realizing that it was based on the body and blood of Christ that I stand before God today? I'm self-examining. In other words, am I in fellowship with him? Because this is a new covenant meal with new covenant blessings. And if I'm not in the new covenant, I shouldn't be partaking of it. So examine yourself that way. And are you trusting in Christ today? Are you, are you allowing the broken body and shed blood of Jesus Christ to impact your life? If so, how so? If not, why not? And lastly, you're examining this. Not only am I in fellowship this way, but number two, am I in fellowship this way? Am I the division? Am I the schism? Am I the discord? Am I the one alienating other people? Am I, am I the one separating into groups? Am I being the one disapproved rather than approved? Am I schismatic in that sense? Right? Uh, am, I, am, I, do I, am I in fellowship this way? Because if, if, if you're going to have communion, you got to be in communion. This way and this way. And if you're not in communion, how are you having communion? 
Does that make sense to you? That's what you're examining today. You're examining, am I trusting in the finished work of the cross? What Christ did for me? Are you looking at his body and his blood, which the emblems represent? And am I walking in love with the body of Christ, the church, the one loaf, the one body that he made in himself? Take a moment, reflect and think as we prepare for the Lord's Supper. Father, thank you for this time of remembrance, this time of uh, fellowship with you and with the saints. Uh, help us as we reflect upon this sermon and help us to remember you, and remember Christ in all things. We thank you, Father, for this. In Jesus' name, amen.